everybody. Welcome to our Careers in Peacebuilding Talk Story Series. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola from the Montanale Institute for Peace here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Our talk story today will focus on social media, peace, and justice with Sanjana Hat Tatua, Kaylika Castain, and Jeremy S Simons. Thank you for joining us today to learn about the journey into the profession. Two years after the Christchurch Call to Action Summit, was initiated by New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in response to the Christchurch mosque shootings. Three academics reflect on where we are now. Today we are joined uh, by Sanjana, Jeremy, and Kailika as a talk story on the role of social media on peace, violence, and its impact on our social and political systems. Our co-sponsor today is the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies Student and Community Association. That is a graduate student club at the University of Otago. The club is grounded in bicultural and multicultural values and principles. The club supports students studying at the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies and engaged at NCPACS, the wider university and the community in justice, peace and conflict transformation efforts, projects and initiatives. And to get us started, I'm gonna turn it over to our friend Kaylika today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose and uh, aloha. Good morning, kia ora. Um, really good to see everybody on this call. Um, so we're gonna, kind of talk story, it's a bit casual today. So if questions come up during, um, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, we will have also some time for questions as well. Um, both um, Jeremy, Sanjana and myself, um, we're all at the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. And this uh, webinar essentially arose kind of out of just some of our internal discussions here about how social media impacts our work. Um, and so I actually, um, I'm a social media manager for a student association on campus. Um, and I also engage in some social media work. Um, I do a bit of consulting with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. So um, I'm definitely not a professional, but it does it is something that um, in my piece work, social media has kind of become something that is just ever present. Um, and so just kind of today, we're gonna be thinking and reflecting on some of the ways that this impacts uh, what we do. I'll hand it over to Jeremy. Good um, morning, is it morning? Yes, it's morning, maybe afternoon, maybe evening, maybe midnight, depending on where you are. Um, yep, my name is Jeremy Simons. I just finished my PhD at the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, and uh, which was looking at indigenous peace traditions in the Southern Philippines, uh, and as well as involvement of indigenous peace activists in transitional justice and peace processes in the Philippines. So my background uh, sort of Preceding that is in restorative justice and have been involved in that in a number of different contexts and levels. And so I also bring that sort of perspective uh, to this conversation and am excited to be part of this. And thanks, uh, Jose uh, and the Matanaga Institute and Kailika as well here at, uh, in Dunedin, New Zealand for uh, pulling this together. All right, Sanjana, feel free to introduce introduce yourself. Oh, I, uh, introduction. <laughs> sorry, I was. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm uh, Ibo and Kiara and Aloha. Um, as Jeremy said, wherever in the world you are, thanks for joining us. Uh, my thanks to uh, Jose and Matsunaga and Kelika for putting this together. Um, I've uh, just completed uh, or in uh, the final stages of completing my PhD. Uh, and have been here since March 2018 in Dunedin at the National Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. But for two decades before that, I've been working around issues related to technology and peace building uh, in, at, uh, in, in Sri Lanka, which is home for me. Uh, and as a consequence of that work, I've been involved in a number of other contexts and countries and with communities, looking specifically at the role, reach and relevance of technology in its broadest sense but increasingly over the past decade, looking more specifically and in a more focused manner on social media. And it's uh, both uh, pro-social, positive, peaceful, liberal democratic uh, potential in, in, in society, as well as I suppose the much more often reported toxic, violent, divisive, uh, polarizing uh, uh, impact uh, as a consequence of these technologies now ingrained in our, our socio-political DNA, uh, which was actually what I looked at in my PhD as well. So more on that later, I suppose, on the call. Uh, very happy to be here and thank you for inviting me too. 
All right, thank you so much. Yeah, we kind of just gave a little bit of um, about kind of what our involvement is uh, with this work on social media and peace. Um, our format today, we have kind of a rough format, but again, if, if things come up that really, um, you know, during this kind of talk story that spark your interest, please put the question in the chat. Um, we're more than happy to kind of jump in and respond and, and let the kind of conversation flow. Um, we'll kind of start off by having Sanjana talk a bit about his PhD research. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about kind of, at least in the context of Aotearoa, where we are, um, a little bit about kind of the, what the Christchurch call is. Um, and then we'll kind of go a bit broader and look into some global impacts. It's kind of a bit, uh, you know, maybe we're overly ambitious in what we're hoping to cover today. Um, but again, that's why, you know, if something really is kind of being relevant to your work and you'd like to explore it a little bit more, please feel free to ask questions. Um, we also hope to be able to tie this in at the end to kind of just everyday uses of social media and how this impacts, um, you know, no matter what work we're doing, um, peace and um, yeah, just kind of daily life. So um, with that, I will hand it over to Sanjana to speak a bit about his PhD research. Um, and then kind of we'll talk a little bit about the, the Christchurch call and kind of what the context is here. All right, over to you, Sanjana. Thanks, Kelika. And I really want this to be a conversation, so I'll, I'll try and keep it short and brief because when you hear PhD research, it kind of immediately goes over many people's heads because of the uh, particular tone and timber and thrust of the language that we use, which isn't decipherable by the majority of the population, usually, which I've really tried hard to steer away from in my thesis, but it's been a challenge. <laughs> um, my work was looking back and reflecting on, so in, in academic parlance, you call this autoethnographic, which is to kind of critically look behind or back at what you have been involved in. Uh, and my journey to where I am today is over, as I said, two decades. Um, and a lot of it has involved pioneering uses of technology in conflict transformation, peace negotiations, ceasefire negotiations, and a whole raft of other things to do with civil society and human rights advocacy and activism in Sri Lanka, increasingly using technology and within that broad family, increasingly using social media uh, for, as I said, purposes of advancing rights and bearing witness to human rights violations, um, as well as uh, having a close eye on um, what you call hate or harm innovation by entrepreneurs who are dictatorial and authoritarian. Uh, and that's the broader remit because in the world we see today, those who are at the forefront of technological innovation aren't liberal Democrats. And that's the kind of uh, big shift away from that uh, wonderful uh, optimism that one had, say, for example, around the so-called Arab Spring. Um, when uh, the web and the internet were supposed to be harbingers of a new dawn of democratic uh, uh, ideas and liberalism around the world. And these platforms were supposed to foment and spread and seed and get everybody onto a common platform where um, authoritarianism uh, and Ill illiberal dictatorial uh, uh, regimes would be held in check. That's a big shift away and seems almost a lifetime away from what we are dealing with today around the world, um, including, by the way, aspects of it are pertinent in Aotearoa as well, but certainly is the lived, embodied, negotiated reality for many Sri Lankans like myself, which I suppose is also a big difference between the Global North Scholarship, which looks at these from uh, a gaze that is not always contextualized or grounded um, in, in our realities, and the difficulty of scholars like myself to articulate what we negotiate, even as we do our PhD. So it's not something that you switch off and go back uh, home uh, and get a restful night's sleep and then come back at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, I have four key things that I look at in my PhD over the course of uh, the three years that I've been here, none of which I planned on studying. I thought I came here with the data that I needed to do my PhD, but the socio-political turmoil in my country since literally the days I left to come here and unrelenting after that provided four key opportunities aside from the Christchurch massacre in March 2019 um, that, became, <laughs> that became my PhD. So none of it obviously was planned when I came. And that's kind of all, I bring that up to kind of say that uh, scholarship in this area is really hard. It takes an immense emotional toll. Uh, 
And for anybody on this call who wants to do this, I think you have to really uh, take care of yourself. Uh, we might not be germane and pertinent to this call, but psychosocial uh, uh, support, um, mental uh, support, you know, the mental health aspects of it uh, are really important for scholarship in this area because it takes an inordinate toll because you are studying what you're embedded in and sometimes your own advocacy and activism are the data signatures you go on to study in a, in a, in a somewhat removed way uh, from, uh, from what you've been engaged in and at a network level. So as I said, I looked at four key events. I won't go into too much of detail, but these were four critical social political developments in the country. One of it was a consequential election. One of it was a, a, a horrendous series of suicide attacks on Easter Sunday in April 2019, a month after the Christchurch massacre in 2019, in March in Aotearoa. Um, one of it was communal riots. And the final part was a 52-day constitutional crisis, all of which, 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 which gave some really interesting moments to study. And this is the point I want to make, the point that um, a lot of the media would talk about and uh, I suppose rightfully critique and frame the harms of social media as a digital construct, as something that is happening online. And the narrative usually is that radicalization and uh, violence and violent things that happen offline are the consequence of whatever that happens primarily or predominantly online. I kind of contest that and that's why I have an unsettled uh, relationship with that kind of narrative because, uh, and we can talk about this certainly Kelika more because on, on all of these platforms, what's really hard to grasp um, and perhaps even um, not very convenient to articulate, which is why the media stories don't really focus on it, is that you have a simultaneous promotion, production, seed and spread of harm, as well as content that pushes back against that harm. So you have at any given time, simultaneous production of everything that is illiberal and undemocratic and violent and authoritarian and dictatorial and partisan and polarizing and divisive. And on the same platforms with the same audience and what we academics call the same platform affordances, which means that you use the same kind of features for human rights activism, for peace building, for conflict transformation, for restorative justice, for transformative purposes, and for civil society advocacy as well. So those are at constant battle with each other. And I suppose what is disturbing is that globally, as well as locally, uh, even though the dynamics would differ, the platforms would differ and how it happens differs, what we are finding is two main things, and Kelly, I'll end with this, um, because we can talk about the Christchurch call later on, um, is that the platforms are giving succor or providing fuel or giving the ability, the space and the freedom for a variety of reasons, both technological, but also linked to the culture, the internal Silicon Valley, white male, man boy dominated, masochistic, misogynist, sexist culture in the organizations that are governing these social media platforms, the space for certain decisions to be taken or not taken that propel divisive, polarizing, violent speech on the platforms in markets like mine. So they might be governed more in the West, but in markets like mine, where there has been a historic emphasis on growth over oversight and profit over principle, you have these platforms now uh, fueling divisive, divisive, polarizing, illiberal, undemocratic, uh, violent content. So that's a problem with the platforms. And then you have kind of linked to this because all these problems are interrelated. You have uh, a, a, a major shift that I said earlier uh, around how authoritarian governments are uh, leveraging these platforms uh, so that uh, all of what the platforms can do are now more geared towards the generation of hate and harm as opposed to what you would think would be used for peace building uh, and social cohesion and everything that is good and great about the world. I think that on this call, at least the participants want to see 
in our lifetime in wherever we are from. Um, and so that is that great contest globally, but also locally. And I'll, let me end by saying that it's also farcical for those of us in the global South to be uh, to witness the 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 West uh, and uh, uh, these these movements that occasionally spring up around the delete Facebook movement, for example, or just deplatforming or getting out of Facebook. I wish it were that simple, you know. Um, I wish that we could just delete Facebook and get out of WhatsApp and then go back to the web and email or whatever that we used. But I think that that's a very um, naive perspective, though I'm not, I mean, I, I understand where the, where the sentiment comes from. It's just that it's so far removed from what we can even begin to imagine in our lives and in our context, because these companies uh, are the DNA of politics. They are why my sister does a home bakery business as much as why uh, a violent uh, a monk can rabble rouse Islamophobia. They are how the president would communicate in as much as uh, civil society would advocate and create activism around. Uh, they are how e-commerce and industry and culture and community and marriages and love and sex and religion are discussed. So you cannot uh, uh, wean away these platforms from what they have become, which is both a great and good thing, but also a very dangerous thing as well. And I think that's the complicated, complex, grounded uh, context that Global South researchers like myself come from, I have tried to articulate and unpack through my PhD. And, you know, before my PhD, during my PhD, and after my PhD, including in our Theroa, uh, you know, have, I suppose we'll dedicate our lives to help others understand, negotiate, and harness the better angels of these platforms uh, towards peace and democracy. Thank you so much, Sanjana. Really uh, a great overview. And I like also to the point you, you mentioned about um, deleting, uh, you know, <laughs> social media. I think, you know, this is something that tends to come up when we start talking a lot about these kind of aspects of the violent uh, aspects of these, some of these platforms and, and little corners. Um, but yeah, as somebody who met their partner on, on social media, I guess, you know, I, you know, you're right. There's so much that we have to, to thank social media for at the same time. I think moving, uh, you know, into the next kind of phase, we, we've mentioned the Christchurch call a bit, and I think, you know, Jeremy had the experience of actually asking on a student panel at the Twitter conference that uh, both Sanjana and Jeremy uh, ran for the center um, uh, in the last few months. And the, I think, Jeremy, you, you maybe can tell the story that there were some students that, that didn't quite know what actually that meant, some young people. Um, so I might just hand it over to you and kind of open this discussion about what really is the, the Christchurch call and and um, yeah, what does kind of this mean in the context of, of Aotearoa? You want me to talk about the Christchurch call? Well, uh, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, say, yeah, I'll yeah. say a little bit about it. Sanjana <laughs> probably knows more. Sure. <laughs> um, but the Christchurch call was an initiative that came out of, and Sanjana, please jump in, uh, that came out of the, the New Zealand government actually after the Christchurch mosque attacks and was really an attempt to harness, to bring together um, civil society, uh, governments and corporations, so social media companies to somehow regulate uh, online harm and the projection of that through social media, particularly because the Christchurch mosque attacks were live streamed on Facebook. And so that was sort of the new thing that uh, that uh, incident represented. And so, New Zealand, along with France, sort of picked up this effort to create this global platform, somehow regulating and moderating and removing content as it sort of emerged. And, and with the intention that would be a collaborative effort, it couldn't be done effectively through some sort of, um, I don't know, enforcement mechanism or regulation. So Sanjana, can you say, any, is, is that about right? Okay. Talk, so, uh, yeah, that's that, that's a great capture and talk about it more later on yeah so anyway all that to say so new zealand had pushed out this big effort it, it got some global attention but we had this conference back in um uh, march that we sponsored and the head of the christchurch call a guy by the name of paul ash was there and he was one of our panel speakers and and we put a question to the audience how many people here have heard the christchurch call and our audience was mostly new zealanders and basically, you know, no one could raise their, no one raised their hand, particularly the young people we had tried to reach out to young people in this conversation. 
And they were like, nope, never heard of that. Christ Church called, have no idea what's going on. So it was really sort of, I think, a wake up call, call no pun intended, um, for the Christ Church call and for probably for others in the room who were concerned about these issues, uh, including indigenous communities who are struggling um, with the same issues, the same potential, positive potentials of social media, as well as the same, some of the same challenges, um, you know, and things that are particular to indigenous communities around like indigenous data sovereignty. What does that look like? So it opens up sort of a whole raft of questions and expands the conversation um, to, to, to ways and, and to arenas that we haven't really even thought about. And so maybe I'll just use that to sort of introduce my sort of my angle on this, which is I'm not a social media expert. I kind of hate social media actually because, and the reason I don't like it is because it works so well. It really hooks me in. And so I try, I've, and you know, what, what I think what Sanjana, you had mentioned about the toll that it takes. And I, and I remember in 2016, I was in the Philippines um, right after Duterte was elected and there was this huge expansion of his war on drugs. And there were just, you know, the, the images that were plastered on regular media, but also on social media. And then these sort of ebate, debates that emerged around, well, these people don't have human rights anyway. Um, with, with the massive number of killings of supposed drug suspects done publicly, performed, you know, and, and left in, in view to, to, send a, to send a statement and a message. And this, it was a form of um, extreme violence, although no one, it was not called that. It wasn't called state-sponsored terrorism, but essentially it was. And, but that had a, a real effect on me, who was living in Davao City, the city where the president had formerly been mayor and had sort of developed this whole program. And, you know, when I started my PhD in 2017, I had to sort of decompress. And part of that was, I think, coming to terms with uh, how, how, how I had been affected by the way that those, that violence had been played out and uh, portrayed through social media. And that's not something I've really talked with people a lot about, but I think that is a real issue. And if you get into this space, and so I'm a little wary about social media, all that to say, but it also ties into my sort of long-term interest and, and uh, involvement in the restorative justice movement. And I call it a social movement because it's not just a, a sort of a criminal justice reform effort, but for those who you know, know about restorative justice, it really is something that tries to put victims at the center of conversations around how is harm addressed um, in a variety of contexts. And it's evolved to include schools, uh, certainly the justice system, uh, whole societies through what we call transitional justice. Uh, so restorative justice has also um, evolved and, and grown over the past several decades. But one area where it has not, that we haven't, at least from my perspective, um, and I and want to just put it out into this uh, conversation, has not r really engaged is around social media harm. We're talking about online harm. What does restorative justice have to say about that? What do we have to offer? And does it matter? Does it help to take a restorative lens to social media harm? Um, because we would, you know, restorative justice says, how are victims, one, at the center of that conversation? And two, what are the obligations of those who are involved with causing harm? And that is a challenge for restorative justice because there's a few key challenges that I've, uh, that in my sort of reading of this, of this intersectionality, uh, have come up with. One is online harm is dispersed. So it's across dispersed communities and restorative justice is used to dealing with um, harm that is really much, much more contained between two people or proximate communities. Two, there's a huge cascade effect of online harm. So the pylon of likes of whatever happens at such a, an incredible scale uh, that the harm is, is, uh, is magnified in a different way than than in uh, when it's just sort of a, um, uh, a, a real world, maybe what you call uh, situation. Third is there's a whole anonymity to that cascade. We don't know actually who is um, piling on in these situations. And fourth, there's a whole structural um, question of structural governance and interference. And Sanjan also off, already talked about this. When you look at what is the role of government of the corporations, of civil society when that is so inter, 
it is one is so interconnected, but those interconnections are so opaque and unclear. And so again, restorative justice has looked at structural harm and violence through transitional justice and related mechanisms. But again, it has not engaged in this conversation. And so that's one of my concerns is how do we bring that conversation forward? One, how do the next generation, I mean, I'm sort of, I've been doing this for 20 years. Who is, uh, how do we help develop a consciousness? How do we help develop training programs? How do we develop conversations and push them forward? For where we can look at these issues um, around, you know, social media violence, harm, restorative justice, and see what can we come up with that is as in creative ways. Because, like Sanjana said, it's so tricky, it's so challenging, and the, you know, it seems like the momentum of innovation is on the side of authoritarianism right now. And so, how do we push back against that in constructive, nonviolent ways? Um, and so those, those are the questions that I will stop with. I've probably thrown out a lot already, but um, we can maybe open it up for some conversation. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. A, a lot of what you're talking about, it kind of, you know, I think also boils down to something that during this conference, you know, that, that we had back in March that you and, and Sanjana organized um, that was funded by the Twitter grant. You know, there's kind of a lot that came back down to responsibility. Like you're mentioning, you know, there's there's all these opportunities potentially for a lot of creative solutions, um, but people tend to kind of look around and say, well, well, who who could be responsible um, for kind of taking this forward? And I, I guess you know, uh, probably one of the big takeaways was that you know, there I think maybe Sanjana can also speak to there are a lot of different sectors. It's not just one sector, and you know, specifically. And I'm I also wanted to just kind of bring up a, a little story. I mean, I, about the conference, I. I, you mentioned the Philippines as well, Jeremy, and one of the really kind of impactful speakers that I remember hearing during this conference was Maria Ressa, who Sanjana invited on, and she's a journalist working within the Philippines who's actually been arrested by the government for um, what has been put on social media. So when we talk about government regulation and the Christchurch call, I think it's also potentially key, and maybe Sanjana can speak to the fact that not all governments kind of operate in a in a similar way. And, and I think also to what governments see as you know, legality, in a sense, also can kind of determine this kind of aspect of regulation. And I don't know, Sanjana, if you have some, some thoughts to share on this and, and, and kind of connecting that. Yeah, so I mean, there's a whole raft of questions that we can spend days and days arguing and, and debating. I mean, this is, I mean, I mean, that's the point, isn't it? I mean, it's such a fertile terrain. Uh, a lot of it is actually fundamentally new for peace building which in 2021, I think is the question, why is it so new for the practice and praxis of conflict transformation and conflict resolution, which I did my master's, you know, close upon 15 years ago. And then that was kind of the time that I was, you know, writing, I'm literally, my thesis was about uh, CSCW, computer supported collaborative work, looking at the use of technology in Sri Lanka's ceasefire negotiations process in 2001. So for somebody like me, this conversation is over two decades old, but it seems that we are, and, you know, Jeremy, we've talked about this, right? I mean, it seems that the conversation is still new for peace building and, you know, you know, the most polite thing I could say is, you know, better wake up and smell the roses because, you know, technology is here and it's being used against peace building and everything that peace building as a praxis and as a body of theory stands for, but it stands then for the peace builders as a community to kind of really embrace the challenge of actually leveraging these technologies for whether it be restorative justice or transformative justice or conflict transformation or, or, or civil, uh, civil rights advocacy and activism. Some of it is happening, much of it is piecemeal, little of it is actually robustly discussed and debated and academically studied in a grounded contextualized form. So I suppose Kelika, that is one thing that we, as a peace building Matsunaga, NCPAX community, I see Richard is here as well, um, you know, as, as an academic community around, you know, uh, these, these issues, we, 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 we really should be focusing on a bit more. But uh, around your point, um, you, know, I, you know, Jeremy referred to the real world, and, you know, that's something that folks like myself don't, don't, don't really use, because one of the interesting things that, you know, arises as a consequence of my study, but also many other studies as well, is that what you very, very, very quickly find is that the individual's really entrenched and immersed in these platforms, consider it to be the real world. There is no disambiguation. There's no distinction made between the world of atoms and the world of ones and zeros, bits, digital. For them, these platforms, these technologies, these interactions that are 
negotiated digitally, uh, like for example, the Zoom call are real. You know, it, it is tangible, it is life. It is the way that they see the world. It is the way that they negotiate the world. It is the way that they frame their responses and reactions and emotions. And very often, by the way, increasingly, the exercise of their franchise as well. So we never say real world. We, we, we use the term offline. And that's kind of what my PhD also looked at around how offline developments, kinetic, physical, political, social, communal, cultural developments uh, in, in, in the world of brick, mortar, and blood, if you will, the embodied self manifests itself in our digital uh, platforms. And of course, the symbiosis between the two. And that's a bloody difficult thing to really study, but also a very interesting thing because you can't distinguish between the two anymore. To speak to your particular question, Kelika, yes, it is actually a really complicated thing to talk about responsibility. And listen, let's not, I mean, I'm a bad representative of the Christchurch call. I'm, well, in the first instance, not, you know, not Kiwi. And, you know, this is something that came out as a consequence of a very horrible thing that happened here. And PM uh, Ardern with President Macron as co-chairs um, uh, who, who, who created the Christchurch call, which is now a platform that includes, by the way, my government in Sri Lanka and many other governments around the world. Uh, that have subscribed to on paper and in principle things that are actually really very good. Yeah, uh, you know, it's around what academics call TVEC, uh, terrorism and violent extremism content. Um, and so, one of the things about the call is it's very statist. It's actually generally less about civil society and more about what governments can do and what their responsibilities are. So, it's one is uh, you know holding governments accountable, holding social media platforms accountable, and then you know it's it's little less about civil society, even though it actually encourages civil society input and has a civil society stream to give input into how the call should evolve. Um, and so it's statist, it's government focused. And I suppose, Kelika, what you know, of the many things that we can talk about, you know, you hinted at the problem and challenge around governments. And uh, listen, I, I you know, I, I, I've made the point that one of the challenges the call will face is that some of the governments who are who are early adopters of the call in principle do it for performative reasons, right? Because it's it's convenient, it's politically significant to be part of the call, even though you are doing everything imaginable inimical to the principles of the call. And so then uh, does the call become a reputational laundromat? That is a specific question I've posed to the call in various private fora. But I think more publicly as the call also matures and Arthur and President Macron would actually grow with this call moving into the future. What we find Kelika is that, for example, and I'll name it, I mean, because I suppose I can, you know, you know what do we do with a government like India, right? The world's largest democracy which by every imaginable metric and measure and news story and barometer of democracy is declining at pace. Uh, and where the platforms are contributing to a great number of social and communal harm, but it's coming from on paper, as I said, the world's largest democracy. So what do you do? You know, how do you grapple with that? What do you do? How do you engage? What are the bilateral and multilateral options? And these are all hard questions. But what you find today is that social media companies and platforms are having a hard time answering some of that. Yeah, because usually the media discourse and the and the academic discourse is around authoritarianism and dictatorial regimes and liberal regimes and you know governments that are notably violative of first principles and human rights fundamentals. But here you have now increasingly, including, by the way, on both sides of the Atlantic, right? You have the United States administration, you have uh, the United Kingdom, you have many other regimes that, you know, Global South scholars like myself would find uh, normally associated with democracy and liberalism, who are coming up with the greatest, uh, you know, number of laws that clamp down uh, on uh, first principles. And let me end by saying that, you know, this whole business about um, responsibility is also rendered complicated because you really need to have a grounded understanding. I'll give you a simple answer I mean, at the end of the day. Listen, I mean, what would fly in our Terawa, right? Because of the, the nature of the state, the nature of the country, the leader that we have in terms of a prime minister, the nature of the government, the nature of the people, communal relations, and a whole raft of other things that make it very different to say Sri Lanka, would be that there would be certain laws here that might be you know, fit for purpose. But the, <laughs> but the challenge is, if you copy paste that, which is actually what happens, 
If you copy paste that law to other countries in the Commonwealth, and for those not on the call, the Commonwealth is a group of countries that were once under British, the British Empire. Um, but if you copy paste that to any other country, even beyond the Commonwealth, it can be really problematic. So what is the responsibility of nation states that are seen to be liberal democratic today in dealing with, say, for example, counterterrorism legislation? And that the jury is out on that. And, you know, just in New Zealand, I think there are some very disturbing signals around a securitized language and a focus on counterterrorism and TVEC and uh, this, uh, you know, this, this singular focus on, on, on terrorism and platforms that is overshadowing everything what Jeremy brings to the table, everything that Kelika, you bring to the table, everything that Richard, who's on this call, brings to the table, and everything that peace building brings to the table, which is to complex, uh, you know, to complexify and complicate um, the, the, the problems that we're dealing with, which also means that you have multiple tiers of responsibility, including social media companies. Now, um, just to end by, by, by flagging for those on this call, and I apologize for Kiwis on this call if I'm repeating some of this, so you have the Christchurch call and the principles around uh, what the government should be doing and the responsibilities of governments and social media platforms also around what they should be doing in order to keep um, uh, uh, the users and citizens safe. You don't have also the Christchurch Commission reports emphasis here in Aotearoa, New Zealand around um, social cohesion. And by social cohesion, they adopt a definition that is around belonging around inclusion, around participation, recognition, and legitimacy, plus also a Maori, uh, a, a Maori identity, a collective sense of identity, um, and based on the uh, first uh, the, the, the treaty obligations here as well in Aotearoa. So essentially, it comes down to the fact that if you don't feel part of society, in some way, degree, shape, or form, you are going to be excluded. You're going to be perceived that you are marginal and parenthetical and peripheral. And that then would lead to downstream problems around radicalization, including through the behaviors uh, around these platforms. And by the way, the call also speaks about, and this might be gobbledygook for some of those on the call, algorithmic calms. And essentially, it means the kind of stories that you would hear about YouTube recommending things that are much more um, violent and, 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 and take you down rabbit holes, um, even though you might not necessarily be interested in that. So. Uh, so a good example is I love dogs and, you know, Instagram, you know, recommends a lot of dog uh, videos and cat videos just because it thinks that that's all I'm interested in. So just imagine if you were searching for something else, the kind of things that algorithmically would be presented to you. So essentially what the Christchurch Commission reports uh, recommendations are around is very important, fundamentally important, is around what do we want as the good in society? and stop just talking about technological or technocratic things and see these things as socio-technological phenomena, which is kind of speaking to my PhD as well. And just you know, to table it, because I think it's important and not every country has it, uh, Aotearoa's counterterrorism strategy has four pillars articulated by the prime minister and also available on the web. One is to understand, the second is to work together, the third is to prevent, and the fourth, which I really like, is to be ready to respond and recover. So seeing terrorism not just as a, 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 as a performative or theatrical act of violence, but also how do we deal with it as a society? How do we consider it? What do we do as a response? How do we grapple with it, knowing that it's going to happen? What are our answers to it? What are our answers to those who would perpetrate it? And what are our answers to those who would be victimized by it? So it's a larger social conversation that the four pillars in the counterterrorism strategy of our terroir, um, at least nominally in principle, uh, deal with. And then you have the kind of four values that uh, the Honorable uh, Foreign Minister has articulated repeatedly, particularly at the Otago Foreign Policy School in uh, a couple of months ago, um, where you the, the, the values of Manakitanga, which is about kindness care, um, about connectedness of Mahitahi, uh, which is a working around a common purpose, and uh, Kotahitanga, which is about shared objectives and unity, uh, and about stewardship and intergenerational well-being. I mean, these are all uh, principles that are at the heart of, as articulated by the Honorable Prime Minister, both foreign policy of our terroir, but also, you know, rooted values within our terroir. And, you know, the reasons I bring this up is that these pillars, you know, are mutually complementary and are unique to our terroir. And that's a good thing. Uh, 
But even then, I have been disappointed that you have a securitized response to the most recent uh, act of terrorism uh, in Auckland. So there is the, always that tension between the state trying to respond in a way that it thinks is going to sell the best, and also what we as scholars know um, is the larger, more complicated problems that you need to uh, that you need to resolve. Going back to what Jeremy said, which is actually probably an intergenerational thing and a communal thing, as opposed to just one thing or the other and simplistic solutions. Thanks, Sanjana. Um, wow, we really covered, I think, a lot of ground with that and a really, yeah, good definition, I think, too, to give us of, of what kind of Christchurch call is and its impact and the impact on responsibility. Something you were saying about algorithms can make me think too about um, conversations that we've had about digital footprint. Uh, you've mentioned that you're, you know, due to the nature of your research, you're quite good at, you know, investigating. That's been part of kind of the skill set you've got about digital footprints. And um, I think, you know, recently we were in the office uh, here at the center and, um, you know, with things that were happening with the situation in Afghanistan, you were actually giving some good guidance and um, things that I ended up passing around to uh, my work with the UN around Afghanistan. Um, kind of this, you know, due to the situation that was happening, people were quite concerned about what were people's digital footprints online, you know, and would kind of affiliations be traced then. Um, and I think for a lot of peace building organizations, there were concerns for people who had worked with the peace building organization about how that could be interpreted. Um, and, and, you know, kind of then people acting out of caution. And, and we took your suggestion, suggestion, Sanjana, in the communications team that I worked on. And actually we had a number of public groups that were for people who had participated in, in fellowships um, with, um, with us who were from Afghanistan, but um, you know, had to go through the process of, of you know, making those groups private um, uh, due to the, the situation. It was a big learning lesson, I think on our end um, about digital footprints and kind of just also being aware of things um, that are happening globally. And it was the first time in my work that I've had to kind of deal with this and, and encounter this kind of response. And I'm just curious, um, maybe we can kind of direct the conversation in that way about talking about digital footprints. You, you also mentioned AI. So, you know, if there's things about um, artificial intelligence as well that we'd like to include. Um, yeah, I think that could also be another, another route to, to explore here in addition to the to digital footprints, because uh, I think during what the conference was mentioned too, um, there was a statement made that I remember. So someone said, you know, can we just rewrite the algorithm? <laughs> can we just rewrite it? And I think there's so many questions around, you know, who's, you know, what, what, you know, kind of untangling this idea of algorithm and how, how algorithms, you know, work and function. And, and perhaps there can be a bit of discuss, discussion on that as well. And kind of opening it up to Jeremy, if anything, um, Sanjana said also, you want to kind of add some things as well. Feel free. I would just Sorry, say just, that the question of, oh. No, go, go ahead, Jeremy, I, I, I have a something, yeah. Yeah, and mine is real short, is when we talk about algorithms, it's not just on social media. I mean, those are being used across the board in governance and policing and social services. I mean, so this question of, in fact, I was, there's a, 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 there's a project, a research project here called algorithmic justice. What does that look like? But it's really around what is the online offline sort of dynamics of decisions around referring children into social service protective custody, which is a huge question that impacts, you know, minority communities, um, children who are overrepresented in, um, in, in protective services or in many Western countries, including the US here in New Zealand. But then it's the question, you know, of that overrepresentation in the prison system, um, you know, and algorithms possibly being used in that context uh, around classification of maybe prisoners um, levels of security and whatnot. So I'll just stop there. It's a very broad thing and then turn it over to Sanjana. Algorithmic transparency, as it's called, is uh, one of PM Zardin's uh, core interests in uh, and around the call moving forward in the year ahead. Um, it is a very, I mean, listen, we could have a you know, conf call about this in and of itself. And, uh, you know, part of the problem, and I'm not even making, this is not hyperbole, this is not uh, an exaggeration. Part of the problem is that if you take just one company, and I won't mention it, but I think it's obvious, that company's chief AI for good scientist resigned silently recently and was covered in a technology review article earlier this year around what he had done to kind of uh, 
inadvertently contribute to what is now a spaghetti of competing AI algorithms that nobody can understand. Let me repeat that. You have a major social media company that is propelled, undergirded by a competing array of AI that the company itself cannot understand, much less control, much less dial towards pro-social, um, non-divisive, civil, uh, democratic discourse. So they are unbridled in that sense. And you, you know, they are unleashed and you can't control them anymore. So I think, Kalika, you hinted at this. One of the things is like, you know, you know, what came out at the conference and many others articulated is let's let's just see the AI. You know, it's like your grandmother's secret chocolate cake recipe. You know, if you see the ingredients, we can bake it ourselves or bake it better, you know, make it better, you know, you know, put a little more chocolate or cocoa, or keep it a little, you know, the temperature in the oven, and you know, we can make a better chocolate cake because we know how to do it. You don't actually, I don't, nobody does. You know, this is highly technical stuff that if you have the, some of the finest brains on planet earth who are now admitting that they can't themselves understand what on earth is going on because of the interrelationship and the interdependencies and the interconnectedness and how the cascade effect that Jeremy talked about, you know, one AI leading to another, you know, it's just too complicated. So it isn't as if you just like put it up somewhere on the web and you can, you know, check it out and read it uh, before you go to bed. So that is the, so that, that is that is the challenge. And just to rearticulate what Jeremy said, you see, a lot of other people think that okay, I'm not on social media, so this doesn't really concern me. Actually, it does concern you, because these are now societal. They they undergird and underwrite all of society, in policing, in justice, in immigration, in refugees, around peace and conflict, around democracy, around franchise, around voting, around. Uh, uh, campaigns around electoral processes, referenda, plebiscite, anything that you can think about is that is central to democratic institutions and governance and parliamentary uh, uh, legislative reform and, 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 and those kinds of processes. All of that is now in one way, shape or form, either entirely algorithmically in, uh, dependent or are going to be in the long shadow of algorithms that many, many users are already part of. So you may not be part of it, but for example, I'll make this very real. In my country, an electoral outcome today is shaped by algorithmic drivers of public responses and reactions, such that there are powerful political entities and there are media proxies who would whip up things, fiction that people get very angry about or very sad about or worked up about and go to the ballot box and, you know, exercise and stamp their vote against something which is an entirely fictitious creation, right? It's, it's a figment of somebody's imagination, but done such that you kind of influence electoral outcomes. Now, this may be Kalika familiar to you and many other, uh, others on the call as a result of what happened on the 6th of January in Washington, D.C., but that's kind of like where, you know, in, and not to be too cruel, and with the greatest of empathy, uh, Global South researchers like myself would, uh, you, know, you know, chuckle a bit because as Maria Ressa has gone on record saying, our markets were the petri dishes of everything that at greater scope and scale, even algorithmically, is now unleashed on both sides of the Atlantic and is coming even here to our terroir. So these are the harms that were first very evident, presented to the companies with evidence, with data, with studies, with research and with analysis, but nobody listened to us. And now, hello, now that uh, you know, the Western markets uh, and it's a bad news cycle and a bad media story, you are suddenly interested in these issues. But okay, fine, you know, let's take it at, at what it is. Let's take it at face value and let's grapple with this problem because it's not going away. And I think it is central for peace building and peace research as well to help understand uh, you know, for even the, the you know, social good and what we want to see as good and what we want to be a more positive, just peaceful future, how we can leverage these platform affordances. Um, and that's kind of what I do as well, Kalik. And you know, you know, our conversations around Afghanistan were partly about digital security and you know, ensuring that what you communicate and what you have as a digital footprint is safe and secure in the event of something that went down, that actually went down in Afghanistan. But it's also 
much more the conversation, and that's why it's complicated, is also about how a civil society can leverage some of these affordances and platforms far better. It's not just about putting a tweet, you know, I mean, you know this because as a social media person, like it's about what you put, how you frame it, what time of day, is it a photo, is it a video, how long is it, or what is the subject, what is the color, what is the background, you know, which platform do you put it up on? Because on, on, on certain countries, if you put it up on one platform that addresses a specific demographic, which may not be the demographic that you want to kind of address. So it's a very, very complicated affair. And peace builders need to be increasingly au fait with the complexity of this, if they really want to kind of have an influence and imprint and long shadow around the communities that they're working with, depending on who those communities are. If it's youth, it's one thing. If it's old people or older demographic, it's another thing. If it's politicians, it's another thing. If it's religious leaders, it's another thing. So it's a kind of helping civil society have that conversation is, is a large part of my day outside of what I have done uh, and continue to do here. Uh, and that's a conversation that uh, happens before the PhD. And I will, I suspect, happen more in the future. But I mean, you raise a lot of questions that we can also talk about uh, more on this call. Thanks, Sanjana. Yeah, what you're mentioning about uh, kind of, you know, basically engaging with civil society, it makes me also think too, I mean, having been a, a public school teacher in Hawaii, uh, still continuing to, to teach now, I think, you know, as an educator, I also am kind of just curious as well about how some of these kind of you know, discussions can happen um, that in, that do engage civil society and kind of also um, educate um, people. And I know I know for me as well, it's been a bit of a learning process. So you know, as I'm talking about educating, I think as somebody who is an educator, I've also had to kind of learn quite a lot about, um, uh, and I'm still learning about kind of how social media um, can be used and uh, what kind of the yeah I guess um yeah the different multi I, I I know that you've said before you know these things kind of shouldn't be separated the good and the bad within social media and I also kind of I, I don't want to necessarily put normative terms on it to, to ascribe a value to it because you're just so you're so right in what you said in kind of the introduction that there's so many ways in which this can be used. Um, I'm I also, you know, some of this makes me think, you know, what the, the work that um, at least within the UN has been doing. Um, we, uh, in my division um, of UNITAR, we've been partnering with UNESCO actually recently um, to try to put out a free micro learning course around um, human rights and, and artificial intelligence. Um, so I think, you know, some of these it, basically, people recognize that it's an issue. How do you begin having these discussions? How do you begin kind of cracking open this Pandora's box, so to speak, about kind of the everything that social media is and how we can kind of protect our own human rights within this space as well? I'm curious, if, Jeremy, if you have other questions or things to add as well, please feel free. And, and also for the audience, um, if anybody would like to, to have a, a, maybe we can throw in a few questions. So I, I'll throw that one out there. But if anybody wants to, to hop in and ask a question, we can we can cue a few for Sanjana. <laughs> Jose, would you would you happen to have anything? Not to put you on the spot, or or also Carol, or anyone in the audience, actually, if we have any questions. I just want to make this more of a discussion because we've been we know we've been chatting, you know, kind of at the void for a number of minutes. <laughs> Well, I have to say, I mean, just it is, I really love just the insight that you all are providing. I think uh, for probably a lot of people in our audience, uh, they're just trying to process everything <laughs> like I am right now. And so um, <clears throat> it's not every day that you get to talk about social media, especially like so candidly, so honestly about it. So I do appreciate this. Um, I know our audience, oh, oh, we have some reflections and thoughts. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll let you all individually um, go through that. But um, what I mean, one quick question that I would have just, uh, I, I always love the, the inner peace aspect of it. So how do you all take care of your, yourselves in, in the midst of just everything that's out there in social media? I mean, you, you're currently or have gone through doctoral programs so wellness like just I think we all need to check in every now and then so let's go first I think yeah <laughs> that's a great question I don't know Jeremy do you want to respond I also I have had some thoughts too on that but go ahead and start us off Jeremy uh, I think it's I mean what you know Sanjay was saying that these this ecosystem of online and offline. And I, 
inadvertently grasped at a word of the real world as if referring to the offline was the real world. Um, but finding your people and the relationships that can nurture and support are just as important. Um, and, and that's sort of a, a, a basic thing. Um, and I think that's, and what I, one thing that happened that was interesting, I referred to, you know, talked a little bit about, you know, being in the Philippines when, you know, Duterte came into power at the national level. Um, there was a whole shifting at that time uh, 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 due to a number of circumstances of sort of alliances and within civil society where people were kind of like, wow, what is going on? And so what was interesting is there were new friends and new relationships emerged that were supportive and protective in that context. And so that was um, really important to, uh, to appreciate those and to, and to recognize those. So I think that's a, a big thing. I think the other is, I mean, a simple thing I've done is I, I, took, I, I took Facebook off my, my cell phone just because it was too distracting for me. And that was kind of a mental health thing. Like, I don't need to be looking at it all the time. I still have other, you know, messaging apps and stuff. But, um, you know, th that, that's, that screen um, flicking, you know, uh, functionality is so tricky to get away from. So that's, that's a quick answer there. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. I, I think this is a really tough question for me, actually, um, Jose. I, I think sometimes in the moment, it can be really hard to take care of yourself is, is my response. And maybe that's not the most helpful, but just thinking about how social media operates and, and how information travels. Um, in the last year, I actually had two friends who um, were forwarding me things because of their connection to conflict zones. So they were quite worried. And so breaking news, um, disturbing videos, um, you know, in a sense, we were supporting each other, but I also think there was something quite traumatizing about us uh, sharing that information as well. So it was a tricky space because we had a space to comfort one another, sure, through our you know WhatsApp messages, um, but also just kind of the way that that information is so visceral and and uh, again with videos, I think in particular, some of that is just burned in my brain, and so I think it's it's very difficult. I don't know that there's a really easy answer for that, especially when it's something, you know, many of us, you know, being interested and involved in peace work, you know, inevitably um, some of the, you know, the information that is getting shared, it, it's, our profession doesn't always deal with the most cheery of subjects. Um, so I think, yeah, I think what Jeremy said, a lot of that is true, but I've also found that for myself, like it, it's tricky, it's tricky to disconnect in the midst of crisis. It's really, really difficult to also to kind of support each other when some of that support is the sharing of information that is quite disturbing. Um, so I don't know if I have a, a very simple answer for that. Um, I'm sorry to maybe Sanjana can provide some some more information because I know he is much more of an expert. And in that sense, I'm you know I wasn't doing anything in my professional capacity, just being a friend. But um, yeah, I think it's it's a very difficult thing in the moment. Uh, I think we can often talk now, you know, when things you know if, in this call you know, about, you know, kind of strategies, but when things actually push comes to shove, um, it's kind of, I feel like social media creates kind of this rapid heightened environment where things are just kind of flowing, information is flowing, and it's very difficult as you're, you know, you know, to find those kind of, you mentioned inner peace, it's difficult to find those moments, and perhaps as Jeremy said, it, it's disconnecting, but sometimes also disconnecting comes at the cost of losing that connection with the person that you're speaking with about what's happening. So um, I find it very difficult to disconnect in those kind of uh, situations. Um, so yeah, that's my response, Anjana. Well, I wish I had the luxury of disconnecting um, is the first response. Um, my studies didn't allow me that. Um, and, you know, you don't talk about what you went through, but it was tough on a, on a number of levels. Um, and I had to seek professional assistance to help me process um, some of the patina of toxicity and hate and violence that I was studying day in, day out, without a break uh, for the duration of PhD studies in, as I said, four significant moments of political violence, really bad stuff um, that you grew up in and now negotiated digitally, but also as an activist self, you were embodied in some of that work as well. Um, and let me also say that, you know, I don't think it's immediately obvious that 
what I see is very different to what Jeremy and Kelika and many others would see. Because researchers like myself see it at scale. So you amplify what Kelika just said to the user base of millions. Um, and you amplify that content, which is why, for example, you have these media stories and they are, by the way, growing at pace around how the human moderation, the, the, uh, the, the farms of humans who go through the reams of the worst content on social media platforms are actually suffering uh, self-harm uh, uh, and worse, by the way, um, uh, because it's uh, presented by these social media companies as something that is algorithmically done by machines. In fact, it's not really. The, the, you know, there are hundreds of humans who are tasked with going through the worst of content. And, you know, there are documentaries about this. You can go and check it out. But, you know, so, you know, there is a toll that I am empathetic, em, em, empathetic to as a consequence of the kind of research that I have done. And then the final point, Kelly and Jeremy, I think is, is that, you know, for me, it was also this ethical burden of knowing. It's a horrible thing. You know, I've always said that it's almost like looking into, uh, uh, you, know, you know, God's bedroom through a keyhole. Because these social media companies, the, the amount of granular um, insight they have on society and communities and even individuals, is, it is extraordinary. You know, it's, it's just unreal. And as researchers, we have access to a sliver of that. And that itself is horrifying. So when you know something is going wrong, when you know there are harms in the near future, when you know there are individuals who you know are, who are possibly at risk, when you know that there are institutions that you have worked with that are possibly going to go into harm's way, when you know that the general direction of travel is to know where are good and taking you away from democratic, free, fair, just, peaceful electoral outcomes, when you know that there is harm against a particular community in Sri Lanka, it's against Muslims and minorities. When you know it, when you have the evidence, when you see the data, when you see the trends, when you have access to that, it was a real ethical challenge. And I talk about this, including with my supervisors and in my thesis as well, around the burden of knowing. Because what do you do? Who do you say that to? Can you say it? How do you say it? How do you articulate it? And then, you know, it goes back to what I said, you sleep with it. You can't not think about it. You get up every day and you sleep with it. And I can't tell you the toll that takes, you know? So um, this is not a study for the faint heart and you really need to know what you're getting into if you're going to go into this kind of work with a view to, of course, you know, contributing to everything that is good, great and potentially, you know, peaceful about these platforms because that's why we do what we do. You know, everybody on this call is to be at least has to be at least slightly mad. Why on earth are we doing this? Why do we sacrifice so much of our sanity, our time, our effort, our energy, our marriages, our love, our fathering, our parenting, our, 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 our good nature, our humor into what we do otherwise? You know, if we are, aren't you know slightly mad, really, at the end of the day. So that's I suppose a je ne sais quoi that drives us to do what we do. But it is really very hard. And I think we really need to talk about it. Maybe not on this call, but, you know, and, and, and as I said, you know, we don't talk about it in public. You know, these are more private conversations that one needs to have. But it's very, very important uh, to, to, to talk about it and to talk about the toll that it takes. Um, there's a number of questions here, you know, with regards to the Christchurch call and the ethical framework. I think the only part, the only mention of ethics and ethical in the Christchurch call is in relation to a point, if I recall correctly, around how media should report terrorism ethically. There's nothing really intrinsic in the call to holding accountable governments or social media platforms to ethical standards. And that needs to be very, very clearly articulated. So yes, I am hopeful that the call becomes an ethical foundation and framework to help govern companies and governments around first principles and human rights principles. Um, but it's not explicit, explicitly and expressly articulated in the call. So it's something that the call needs to be shaped to become, as opposed to giving life to something that is in and innate in the call. So there is potential, but we need to really work at it. And I suppose that's the role for civil society as well. Um, with regards to echo chambers, it's bloody difficult. I mean, that's a broad question in and of itself. And I suppose 
one of the things that, I mean, at its very simplest, I mean, I'm not trying to belittle the challenge, but at its very simplest is to realize that it is an echo chamber. You know, uh, and many people don't. They think that as a consequence of all of that they see and all of that they engage with, that my God, it's actually a larger population of the converted and people who believe what I believe in. And then thus I am validated. But actually the algorithms are serving up only what they think, what you know, what the machines think that you will be interested in. And so the first step, I suppose, is to actually understand that what you are partaking in, part of engaging with and responding or reacting to is a construct. You know, not to get uh, too much into the matrix, you know, 20 years after it was released and, you know, just before the next uh, version is released in December. But it is really like a matrix. It is an artificial construct. And uh, we give so much of agentive power to what in our hearts and minds, uh, are, uh, you know, respond to something that is entirely fictive in nature. I mean, that's an essential thing that we need to always remind ourselves around. Of course, it has offline consequences that are very real. But you know that's the point. I mean, we are being drawn into echo chambers, and we need to be conscious about it. Um, Ashley, who is in the other room, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think that um, uh, where was Ashley's question? Uh, it 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 is difficult to talk about the complexity and the intricacies. Um, but, you know, when I was reading that, the one thing that came to mind, and I'll just end by saying, again, it's a longer question, uh, a long, longer answer, is that what I have found in my PhD journey is that absolute lack of grounded, contextual, mixed methods research around social media harms, um, which is one big problem. Um, so you have uh, non-located, in, in academics, you call it the gaze from nowhere, you have non-grounded uh, 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 studies talking about a particular context, but very far removed from it, or just having visited it once for a holiday. I mean, it's absurd, but it's true and it happens. Um, so I suppose grounded, contextualized, mixed methods research that you know takes in embodied realities as distinct from data signatures um, is, is very, very important. So you know, that's, you know, that's something that, that I uh, am a great champion of, simply because it doesn't exist in academia. Uh, and if just that was done, um, I think that we would make vast, great strides into understanding just the nature, degree, and uh, 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 ways in which these platforms uh, exist in, 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 in offline realities and how online it, 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 it's, it's mirrored. Which is, by the way, I mean, one of the chapters is in, in, in my thesis is, is, is comparing uh, Christchurch and Aotearoa after the massacre in March 2019 with Sri Lanka and after the suicide uh, uh, terrorism in April 2019. So I look at Twitter uh, and ostensibly the same platform, same affordances, same features, same functionality, different markets. And uh, I look at why there was such a fundamental difference. I mean, there's night and day. I won't go into it in too much of detail, but it's literally night and day. So then I ask the question, what the hell made it different, right? I mean, surely it can't be something because of the, uh, the platform or, or could it? And uh, to cut a long story short, uh, what I discovered was that uh, political and media culture makes a huge difference, uh, perhaps the fundamental difference. Um, and so if social media platforms are representative, reflect, uh, reflect and refract uh, offline realities, then it seems to be the case that in our Aotearoa, um, the conversation after the Christchurch massacre was what it was because of what our Aotearoa is. And in Sri Lanka on Twitter, the conversation and the harm and the violence that was promulgated and amplified on the same platform was, it is what we are, you know, and, and what we were and have been decades before social media. And so these are social harms, uh, social political divisions that existed far longer and has been, uh, have been exacerbated as a consequence of social media platforms. So I suppose those kinds of grounded nuanced studies uh, are really vital in understanding uh, how we can, uh, you know, uh, get our heads around uh, some of these more complex challenges. Otherwise, it becomes, I mean, I take your point, it becomes rarefied and abstract and, and you know, really very hard to get your head around anything. Um, uh, and so, you know, that's, that's one thing I can offer as a consequence of my work. Thanks so much, Sunshine. Um, you did a good job hopping in there and, and grabbing some of the questions that we also had on the board. There was one kind of question I wanted to come back to to kind of ask Jeremy if he had something to add as well. I know Bridget asked about kind of who wasn't at the table 
um, you know, with the Christchurch call. And I, I think, you know, Jeremy, you were um, both, you know, at the, the conference that uh, NCPACS led, the Twitter com the sponsored conference, um, you engaged in some discussion um, uh, and uh, I think as kind of a moderator with um, basically, you know, people who are involved in indigenous communities that were also working with social media. And I'm curious if you have kind of just some insights to share there and also your work. Um, I know, you, you know, your research um, for your PhD was uh, working around kind of um, indigenous communities and NGOs within the Philippines. So I'm curious if you just have some insights there um, just from kind of your conversations that you've had as well um, to add to that. Yeah, I think, um, well, there's a couple things um, here. It, one is this, the, the disparity still of, I think, people's awareness and understanding of just the, the basics. And I include myself, you know, it's, it's really a learning to be on a learning curve to understand, you know, this complexity. But we really have an obligation, I think, and, you know, the question, what is, one, what is one thing that we can do? And I think that's actually a huge thing is we can um, educate ourselves and educate those around us and particularly those we care about. And I think this goes back to that uh, question uh, from my friend from Davao um, who says, how do we, you know, how do we bring accountability to what people post? I think helping people um, understand and what is actually the, the, the sort of the echo that ecosystem or that that reality of what it includes and the challenge with that is we then have to be able to not get sucked into the emotional response to a particular post or a particular conversation or a particular echo chamber and so that's I think the challenge for us and you know for me I try to do that with my family because that you know my, my in my family I have a whole variety of perspectives political perspectives from around the world um and I realize that, you know, I can't get angry at people because people are struggling to wade through this re and, and, and uh, under various levels of understanding. So I think that's one thing um, in terms of, and so what, when we look, look at communities, um, say indigenous community, you, know, you know, that's interesting at the conference, uh, I moderated two discussions. One was with youth and one was with indigenous um, uh, social media researchers, sort of activists. Uh, now, youth, sort of young people, and uh, are, are very social media savvy, obviously, but um, there is still, I think, a lack of understanding around sort of what's behind the, the, the use of social media. Uh, the second thing is, and I think the, the indigenous, the Maori and Pacific researchers that were on our panel, I think what they were alluding to is there's actually um, a huge need um, again, the, the gaps and the divides are also play out in social media spaces. So there's certainly a lot of use and engagement by indigenous communities on, on and through social media. But again, the understanding is still not necessarily, um, uh, is not very strong. And so I think this, again, this educational component is really important. Um, and, you know, yeah, so I guess that's, to me, that's what comes to mind. Uh, I think these conversations, there's also how do we, um, you know, how do we avoid getting sucked into these personal attacks? I think having these kinds of conversations with people um, where we can talk about it uh, in non, in sort of non-threatening, non-polarized uh, context is really important um, because otherwise it, it is just so easy. And that was the reason I haven't totally disconnected from Facebook. I just moderate you know, I took it off my phone so that that particular distraction point wouldn't be there, which allows me to engage in a more productive way. Um, so that's the thing is finding what your everyone has a different level of what they sort of is tolerable and what sort of puts them into maybe a negative space or not. And so being self aware, like um, uh, Jose, you were saying, you know, that how do we deal with the inner side of it is really important. There's moments where we need to step away. There's moments where we need to, to jump in and, and engage. So, so. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, you bring up some, some really great points. And um, yeah, I think uh, what you've mentioned too with, uh, you know, I, I think I've said before in this call, I also feel like I don't really have some of the tools to be able to navigate the this, this space of social media. We kind of turn here to Sanjana as our, 
resident expert, but um, you know, I think maybe we can kind of shift the focus to thinking kind of about how this affects our careers and everyday peace. And I, I like that, uh, you know, Lori put a question here in the chat. I'm just curious about how educators can be better equipped to support students to safely access and utilize tech. Um, and, you know, I think maybe we can extend that to not just students or not just specific communities, but, but actually really more broadly, um, just, you know, all, all groups within civil society. Um, I think there's kind of, you know, I, I often feel like I maybe don't have the skills or the tools to be able to engage with social media as it kind of relates to this peace focus or even kind of responding, or, you know, counter discourse to violence. So I'm just curious, you know, if there's any thoughts, things that you've come across, Sanjana or or Jeremy, and, uh, you know, maybe also to some some discussion to here of, of restorative justice. I don't know if that also could potentially tie in, Jeremy. So I'll hand it over to, to both of you. Yeah, I listen, I know that this is um, a conversation about social media, but uh, peace building is not about necessarily social media. It's about hard work, face-to-face, -face, physical, generational, communal work. Um, so there is nothing that says uh, that uh, this needs to be conducted digitally and over social media. And that's something to keep in mind. In as much as we need to embrace the potential and how inextricably entwined technology is with peace building today, I always start with what do you want to see and achieve as the good that needs to drive then how we approach the conflict transformation processes, mechanisms, and blueprints, and engagement um, with uh, communities that are central to that endpoint we want to get to as a process. Some of that may involve technology and social media. Much of it may not. And it really depends on the nature of the question. So I always steer away from technocratic determinations around how educators and peace builders should use social media around the more important question for me at least, which is what do you want to see and who are you working with and where are you and what do you want to achieve and a whole raft of other questions that are antecedent to one's selection and adoption and adaptation of technology. Because if you focus on the technology, I think there are many, many things that have gone wrong and will go wrong. Having said that, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, it's also to learn what the platform affordances are. Uh, you know, there are organizations doing this work. It's not like 20 years ago when I wrote my master's of research that there was actually nobody doing it. Now it's actually studied. It's, uh, there are best practices, there are lessons learned. Uh, the UN is doing it, Kelika, as you know, uh, not just with uh, UNESCO, but with other entities as well. Um, and a lot of people are talking about it. Um, the ICT for Peace Foundation has been pioneering. Uh, and if you go to our website, there's a lot on it. Um, I've written so much about the Christchurch call uh, that's in the public domain. Um, and so there's a lot, there's a lot that's been written that I suppose give guidance and direction around best practices around uh, the use of social media. Um, but the third point is actually what Kalika, you said earlier. I mean, uh, educators and whoever who's using this needs to be really aware. Listen, at the end of the day, human history is around the abuse and misuse of information. And what is gathered and harvested and collected and curated for good and benefit and democratic and liberal and peaceful and just purposes, as the case of Afghanistan only too unkindly reminds us, can overnight be transformed into platforms and databases of uh, stentorian control um, and dictatorial uh, outcomes um, that are vastly harmful for societies. It's the same information, but unless we are very careful in minimizing the gathering, you know, goes back to first principles of do no harm and do no harm's application and applicability in uh, digital uh, peace building. Uh, things about, you know, what's going to happen to uh, this data after we after the project ends and just asking the questions such that uh, what we may uh, be doing for the best of uh, intent will not lead to the worst of outcomes. So that's partly a technological issue because you need to understand the technology to understand what the harms may be. But that's also going back to first principles, I would think of peace building, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's do no harm. It's kind of ensuring that you have a light footprint. The communities are the custodians of what they uh, know best to do 
What you are trying always is to empower the local resilience and the local knowledge, never to kind of impose what you think should be done, is to have the humility to ask the questions first and then propose answers, and to have the global, local, regional, and maybe international awareness to kind of synthesize what may work in ways that are culturally appropriate and have uh, enduring relevance. And finally, I suppose the new, 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 well, not new, but you know, another part in the toolkit is to have the technological prowess to know which technologies work when, how, with whom, why, what, and towards what ends. Um, so and it's a broad discourse that I think you kind of, like Lego, you kind of make the model as one can see best fit, depending on the context that one's working in. Can I ask it? Go ahead, go ahead, Jeremy, go for it. Sorry, I was just looking at uh, Jacobo's questions here around as a social media manager and in the Philippines, you have elections coming up, so things heat up um, quite a bit. Are there, are there best practices, Sanjana, of uh, uh, places, countries, um, elections, where uh, the, all the heightened sort of intensity that comes with elections has been managed well? through social media, um, from your knowledge base? Uh, no, because uh, it depends on the context of the country and electoral process, right? So um, in India, in Sri Lanka, in the United States, your country, in the United Kingdom with Brexit, in many other processes of elections and electoral outcomes and plebiscite and referenda, you find that uh, things are increasingly toxic and polluted and polarized and divisive as a consequence of uh, political entrepreneurs and their media proxies getting on board and leveraging social media for their own ends, which is to kind of pollute the discourse and achieve an intended outcome, which is very far removed from what is ideally the best possible outcome. Um, and so it depends, the nature of the violence and the kind of contestation all depends on what country you're looking at. Uh, there is, you know, what you call is you try to build friction. So part of it is media literacy in the larger population. It's educators and, you know, academics call them semantic authority. I mean, people who are believed and trusted kind of trying to kind of tone down and then say, listen, look here, you know, calm, you know, just calmly interrogate what the issues are. Don't be, you know, you know propelled by emotive responses and kind of trying to create friction in large society around being governed by the emotive content online. Part of it is the nature of the government, but it's not helpful if the government is the interlocutor and is the worst actor in the, uh, in, in the process. Part of it is actually social media companies. And there's a hell of a, I mean, you, I can't even begin in this call to uh, 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 outline uh, the multiple competing uh, uh, governance and oversight mechanisms amongst and even just within one company that try to create friction uh, around the worst possible outcomes that they have as a consequence of dealing with uh, the 6th of January or other parts, uh, other, other contexts and examples uh, now you know, are taking seriously and that these platforms are directly contributing to uh, social harm. So society, government, social media companies, they're all trying to kind of uh, uh, do things to um, stop what we call platform instrumentalization or weaponization. There's huge variance, there's huge differences um, markets like the Philippines would differ vastly in terms of the human resources, technical resources, algorithmic resources that one would find would kick into gear, say, with the Canadian elections that were just concluded, um, or the general election in Aotearoa, uh, which was done last year, which I actually studied, and it's fundamentally different in the way that people talked about and the platforms operated to, say, the Sri Lankan elections, which I studied for the PhD. So that, I mean, by the way, I mean, there's a lot that's written by the companies like Facebook and Twitter about what's there and the companies will do to stop this from uh, spilling over into offline violence. Um, there's stuff that's coming out of some, you know, places like NATO Stratcom, um, the House of Commons in the United Kingdom, um, and uh, a lot of think tanks and NGOs in the United States as a consequence of the 2016 presidential election, but also the long shadow of that uh, and how social media companies um, uh, and government and, and civil society and government can kind of stop all this. So there's a there's a plethora of data. I'm I'm not familiar with the Philippines directly. I would imagine that there are very intelligent people and very committed people like yourself, Jeremy, and those on the call who are interested in democratic, liberal, peaceful, just outcomes of whatever electoral process that takes place. And you know, you have Maria Ressa. You know, for God's sake. I mean, you know. Um, 
an individual who is globally recognized, a time person of the year, who has dedicated her life to understanding the role that platforms play in authoritarian uh, cycles, as well as in terms of democratic expansion as well. She's coming out with a new book, I, I can plug it for her, uh, that speaks to her struggles later on this year. But she is constantly writing. She's on Twitter, she's on Facebook. Uh, her media outfit is constantly putting out content, uh, aside from the Philippine context, also looking at how technology is playing a role um, in, in everything, Jeremy, that you are far more the expert on. So you have local people, you have international examples, um, and maybe that's a broad answer uh, to your question. Yeah, thanks, Sanjana. Um, I know we're a little short on time here. I, I just have a concluding kind of thought, I think, before I hand it over to Jose. Um, and I, I put a little bit about Maria Ressa. We've mentioned her a few times. I think we didn't really intend to mention her as much, but she really, when we start thinking about the conference, she's really just quite an inspiring individual that we had a chance to, to hear. And, you know, uh, Sanjana knows her personally, so definitely someone to check out her work. Um, and I think the level of commitment as well that she has to kind of also pushing back um, is really inspirational. Um, so definitely look into her. Um, when it comes to Lori's question as an educator, I, I, I was thinking a lot about what Sanjana said, and you know, we don't have all the answers. I think this takes a lot of brainstorming from our communities. Um, I know that as an educator myself, some of the things that I wish that there were, I wish in schools that we focus more on social media, writing for social media, identifying things like disinformation and misinformation. Um, these are things that um, actually have been added, at least here in Dunedin, to um, work with the Girl Guides here or Girl Scouts. Um, and they actually have a unit on this now for Surf Smart. Um, so introducing young kids to some of the kind of, you know, you know, being able to kind of think about things a little bit more critically, essentially, I think, critical thinking skills for the internet <laughs> um, and being able to kind of navigate that space, navigate bullying and violence, you know, those kind of issues. So, um, you know, I think there's definitely more, as Sanjana mentioned, to kind of be developed in this area. And I think I mean, maybe this, the people in this room are part of that movement to kind of develop these new resources for people to take forward. So with that, I might hand it over to Jose. Are there any closing thoughts from Sanjana or Jeremy? Okay, all good. All right, over to you, Jose. I'll, I'll just, yeah. Um, no, I think, uh, I think these are just really important and I, I appreciate that, you know, everyone hopped onto this, um, this webinar and thanks again to, you know, Jose Matsunaga Institute for, for putting this forward. And I think, the, I think these kinds of conversations are actually one of the key things that we can do and inviting people into our own conversations. Like, you know, Jacobo was talking about the Philippine context. You know, there's gonna be people who are really keen um, in that situation who are social media managers. Of course, the Philippines is one of the most online countries in, you know, in the world, in Southeast Asia. And so uh, I, think, I think continuing to have these conversations, opening them up um, and, and providing those spaces where people can talk and, and raise the questions, the concerns in a safe space, I think is just huge. And coming to, you know, that I think I would hope that, you know, collective shared sort of um, agreements around how people will engage with these conversations can actually have, can actually have a, a positive impact on the wider context. doesn't mean everyone's going to buy into it, um, but I think it, it actually does help and it does matter. So that, that's what I'd like to disclose with. I will take it back now. Thank you so much. Just, uh, I'm gonna be processing this for some time uh, and look forward to definitely checking in on my process. But uh, thank you, Sanjana, Kalika, and Jeremy for allowing us to learn about your work um, in this field, in peace building, just the wealth of knowledge and just revert back to some of the key words that kind of the power of that knowledge and what to do with it. Um, because yeah, I mean, many times I myself have like learned about what's happening somewhere else in the world through social media because the local news or national news is not covering it. And so what to do with that knowledge. Um, but yeah, the self-care is so evident and uh, thank you so much for those tips. And uh, I mean, that's, and yeah, so thank you so much for the wealth of knowledge that can guide our you know, future peace related projects. Truly appreciate all opening up about your experiences today, the lessons learned, the tips that come out of today's dialogue, and just the 
importance to be having these dialogues and to continue to have these dialogues because that is, I think, once more at the essence of peace building and relationship building. Once we start having these dialogues, we can get beyond just, you know, these social platforms where sometimes it's just used to like, you know, like a blog to use so much hate and whatever uh, frustration we may have. And um, let's take it the next step and try to, at least in a virtual format, try to have these dialogues. So thank you. Um, Thank you for your kindness and leadership in this field as we explore our journey into the profession. Uh, last but not least, thank you all for joining today's webinar. We deeply appreciate your interest and support in joining us to learn about exploring the journey into profession through our careers and peace building talk story series. Thank you again, everybody.